can't begin to fathom how we should gain at your loss, your loss, at your sacrifice. And yet, Heavenly Father, that's exactly what you say. Because you loved us so much, you are willing to go through so much. And Lord, we just bow and we worship, we acknowledge your greatness. We're here today, or whether we're watching on live stream or whether we're in person, we're here today at this moment to hear your word, to hear you speak, to fall in love with you, to, to rewrite the ship of our life, to put some wind back into the sails, to head us closer and closer towards that moment in which we get to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. So thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to proclaim your word, to hear your word, to sing your word, and Lord, to be engaged in this wonderful task. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, please be seated. Those who are home watching on live stream, welcome. Glad to see you. For those of you who are sitting amongst us, welcome. Glad to see you. Thank you for joining us. Years ago, years ago, many years ago, when Amy and I were but dating. That was eons ago. And um, she, I had been getting to know her son, and um, her sister was going to get married, and her sister was living in Seattle at the time. And, and so the family said, hey, we need to have Amy's, she's dating this guy, they're fairly serious, let's bring him up to the wedding as well. And so I went up, and I was introduced to her mom and dad, her sister, brother-in-law and, and whole relatives, and I got to be kind of the person on display, even though I was at her sister's wedding. And, and it was interesting because what I also learned is I also learned a lot about Amy in the process. So, um, we just were dating, and so I was getting to know her. By getting to know her, I had to get to know her family. Had to get to know another perspective of her. And a little bit, and that's what we're going to do this morning in our text. We're going to start something new and we've been reading it, and we're very familiar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, that describe Jesus. They describe Jesus. We have walked with him. We have seen him heal. We have seen him, him feed thousands. We have talked to him. And we listened to Peter when we did our series on First Peter. We listened to Peter. We, we engaged, and we know Jesus well through the Gospels. And we're going to now take, and we're going to get to know him even better through John. But this is years after he writes the gospel. He writes this, he actually receives this revelation from Jesus. And we're going to spend months, months just simply finding out and figuring out who Jesus is from the perspective of John, of Jesus, as Jesus um, dictates a revelation, if you will. The revelation of Jesus, it says, as written by the Apostle John, is a personal letter to the churches in Asia. And so John is writing this letter, and it addresses seven different churches in Asia. And so I wanna, want us to go in our imaginary mind for a moment. Imagine we're part of a church. We're part of a church, and I want you to hear, hear the voice of God when he says, imagine you belong to a church that has endured perseverance. I mean, persecution. You've persevered. You've been tested. And, and, and the leader, John, he's disappeared a couple of years ago. He was, he was kind of cast out. And, and you don't have the codified scriptures yet. You don't have this. You have, might maybe you have a couple of letters from the Apostle Paul around, but I don't know. And, and you have the spirit moving, but, but you've been persecuted, and you've been tested, and you've been tried, and you know that there's something wrong. Imagine you're going to that church, and then you get this letter and you hear these words addressed to you, and it says, I know. I know. Imagine that you belong to a poor church where people slander you, and they call your Lord names, and they think that you're a fool because you believe in him, and you hear the words, I know your pain. Imagine you belong to a church in a difficult community, and there are members of, in the church who, who justify sinful behaviors that are acceptable in the community. And you hear these words, I know your community. Imagine you belong to a church where spiritual leaders mislead its members to embrace sinful practices. 
the leaders of the church kind of say, oh, that's okay, you can do that. You can participate in those sinful behaviors. And you hear the words of Jesus say, I know your faith and your love. Imagine you belong to a church that is active in the community. It is doing good. It looks good to others. You feed the poor. You take care of the widows and the orphans. You're doing a lot of good external things. And, 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 and you're, you're, you're really looking good on the outside, but you know that there's something wrong, and you know that inwardly the church itself is dead. And you hear the words say, I know your reputation. Imagine you belong to a church that has simply persevered. Hardships have come, and your strength is sapped. And you're just asking God, how long do we got to continue doing this? How long must we persevere? How long must we endure? And you hear the words of your Lord say, I know you have little strength. Imagine you belong to a church that has everything that it needs. It has all the toys, all the trinkets, all the technology. It is loaded and it is wealthy. You think that you're blessed because of all of your good deeds, but in, honest, in all honesty, you know that the church, even though it has all the toys, the trinkets, and the technology, you know that the church is actually bankrupt. And you hear these words, I know your deeds. I know. I know your pain, your community, your faith, your love, your reputation. I know how much you give, why you give it, and I know your deeds. I know, says Jesus. I, I, that's a message for us today. That's a message for us. It's going to be a message for us throughout this series is I know. Jesus knows. He knows your deeds. He, know, he knows whether you're spiritually, you look good on the outside, but you're dead inwardly. He knows rather why you do what you do. He knows your motivation. He knows your heart. He knows why you give what you give. He knows the community that you're in. He knows the friends that you hang out with. He knows how much money you make, how much money you give. He knows whether or not you're alive or dead spiritually. He knows. It's not a surprise to him where you find yourself. This letter, this revelation that Jesus gave John, John then gives to the churches in Asia, and we get to peer through the window and watch and learn and listen to you. The message for us is that God knows. God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows the hardships that you're going through. He knows the challenges that you're facing. He knows the joys that you get to experience. He knows. It's of no surprise. And so we turn to the book of Revelation. If you're not familiar with it, it, just open up your Bible to any page and head towards the back. And just keep thumbing until you get to the very back, and then you're going to see a lot of words that say this means that. Go forward a little bit more. It's the last book in the Bible. It's not the index. It's not the little dictionary if you have a Bible like that. Just go back and, and turn with me to John, I mean to Revelation chapter 1. I still have some more intro, but I want you to know that Revelation has a promise to it. You open up the book and you begin to read the first couple of words and there's a promise in it. The promise is a blessing to everyone who reads aloud this word. To everyone who reads it, you become blessed. Just simply reading it, the Spirit will work in your heart in an amazing way. The word blessed describes a person who is free from the daily cares and worries of the, every breath that you take. It is not a blessing that says, wow, wow, I've got more money in my account, or wow, I've got the right spouse. It's a blessing because you've put all of your cares into the hands of God. Every circumstance is in the hands of God, and so you say, God, fill my hands with you today instead of fill my hands with something else. It's a blessing to read the word. One person, one commentator named Vincent, he says this about a blessing shaking itself loose from all thoughts of outward goods. The word means it becomes the express symbol of a happiness identified with pure character. When you're blessed, when you're blessed, the idea is that it's a happiness associated with a pure character, not with the latest gizmo, not with the latest phone, not with the latest car, or whatever you want the latest of. That's not a blessing. The blessing here is the fact that it is an inward character that you have, and you can, you can weather the storms because you know God has you in his hands. It's a promise to everyone who hears it and takes it to heart. 
It, it, it is the idea of you just don't hear it, but you actually apply it, you actually listen to it, you actually engage with it. In my communication class that I'm teaching, I spent the whole class, uh, first week of class was this week, and, and the third lecture I gave was all on listening and helping the students understand the difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is where you hear a noise. You might hear the fan in the background. You might, you might be hearing the um, vibrations in your eardrums of the sound being emanated from the speakers. You might hear all of that. But that's just noise for you. You need to listen to it. What is it saying to you? What is it meaning to you? What are you how, how is it being absorbed in your very person? Because you need to take it to heart. You can't just come in and hear the word and say, yeah, I went to church. That doesn't, where the blessing comes from. The blessing comes from you hear the word of God and you take it to heart. Matthew 7, 26, Jesus at the end of his Sermon on the Mount gives this illustration. He goes, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, does not put them in their heart, is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And so I was watching something this week, and I want to show you this. This is a, a, a housing track. This is a, a development in Indonesia. And you're in Indonesia, and then you can see there's all kinds of roads and stuff, and, and the people didn't know. They would go out in the yard, and they would work in their garden. They would go, they would probably trees close by, branches. Look, there are roads that go in and out. And then what happens is there's an earthquake. And in this earthquake, watch what happens to these people who built their house on the sand. There's a quick little two or three second intro, and then watch what happens. There's an earthquake. An earthquake happens. Look at the land move. This happened this month. Those are people's houses getting absorbed as their house, the dirt underneath it, turns into liquefaction. It's a satellite image of an earthquake in Indonesia. And the people had all built their house upon the sand. And as a result, whenever the earth shook, whenever there was an earthquake that happened, their house was completely destroyed. They thought it was firm. They built roads across the sand. They built their house. They laid a foundation. But when the earth shook, their house came tumbling down. Is not the lesson evident and obvious? What are you building your house on today? It might look good. It might look solid. It might be secure. And you're okay until tragedy strikes. An earthquake rumbles in your house. Figuratively and maybe literally. And what do you trust in? What are you trusting in? Are you trusting in the earth to hold still? Or are you trusting in God's word? James chapter 1, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do not merely just hear the word. Okay, I heard it, went to church, it echoed in, made vibrations, my brain registered it. But do what God's word says. I have a great application for us at the end of this sermon, so you're going to want to listen to the end God's word, it promises a blessing to everyone who hears it and reads it and takes it to heart because the time is near. The time is near for what? Time refers to uh, a unique time of the end. The word near means it is eminent. It isn't as if John was writing to the churches in Asia and they said within three days, that's near. The idea of that word near is that it is eminent. It will happen Whenever God says it's going to happen, then it will happen. You need to know the time is eminent. Time being whenever God decides for it to happen, and you get a blessing. The very end of the revelation of Jesus. And by the way, it is called the revelation of Jesus, not revelations. There's no S to this. This is a, a, a one a plural, singular meaning. Yeah, singular. It says, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. It is eminent that I am coming. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. It's eminent. And you get a blessing, the internal knowledge of knowing that God loves you and he is coming to get you. James also says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is eminent. It is at hand. Peter one of the disciples of Jesus writes, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. There's an eminence about it. There's, there's, there's an opportunity that the, the eminence, the return of Jesus is coming. And, and when Jesus comes, 
This is bad news for some of you. You will not have time to prepare to meet him. You won't. And so you won't, be, you won't get a notice on, the, on your text message that says, by the way, next week Jesus is coming. Put your house in order. You're not going to get that. You're not going to get a notification on your email or a phone call from an angel that says, hey, Paul, yeah, hey, I'm an angel of God. I just want to let you know I'm coming in the next week. That's not going to happen. He's going to come. And when he comes, he expects his servants to be working. When the master returns, Jesus gave a parable about this. When the master returns and the employees, they didn't know when he was going to come. And he sent them, he said, hey, you be busy doing what I've gifted you to do. I've equipped you to do. I've told you to do. You be busy doing that. I want to see you working when I come back. And so the master doesn't want to come in. He doesn't want to come into a house that is in disarray. He doesn't want to come into a house that is all cluttered and unclean. And there's no food, no preparation at all for the master to come. When the master comes home, he expects his house and his, all of his empire to be in working order, even though he's out of town. You guys get the application? You guys got it? You guys understand what, what has? You, don't get, you won't get an opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to get my life together. When I get my life together, then I'll walk with Jesus. It is get your walk with Jesus, and he'll put your life together. Why do we receive a blessedness when we receive this book? Why will we receive a blessed? Because Revelation is about, look at this. This comes back, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this in a second. Revelation is about Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus Christ and his ultimate fulfillment of God's purpose. And by the way, if, if you have the church, our community church app, there are some fill in the blanks. You can come along and you can fill them along. If you're watching on the live stream, feel free to col- connect to the link and you can fill in every yellow spot is a fill in the blank technology wise. Feel free to take it. You know, uh, the reason that we're doing this series now is uh, months ago, I was reading Revelation in my devotion. And in my devotion, I just saw over and over and over in every chapter and on every page, Jesus. And that's going to be our focus. Our focus is going to be on Jesus. We're going to get a different perspective of Jesus. We're going to see him differently than we did in the Gospel of Mark, where things happen instantly. We're going to see a different perspective than we do in Luke, the good doctor. We're going to see a different perspective than Matthew gave you, the good Jewish man who wanted you to see he fulfilled prophecy. We're going to have the lamb that was slain. We're going to have the one who, who, who's the judge. We're going to see Jesus in a different light this week. So we get blessed if we read this, right? If you read it aloud. And so what we're going to do this morning as we move into the text, as we move into the text is we're going to read this aloud. Church and you at home, I want you to use your voice, and I want you to read this loud. And now I'm going to remind you, I'm going to remind you of this. When we read out loud, we pause at punctuations, and then we continue reading until the next slide, okay? And so in this one, you would say the revelation from Jesus Christ. Pause. See the comma there? And since we're reading aloud, we're reading in unity, we'd say the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must take place soon. All one thought, therefore it's one breath. If you don't have good lungs, fake it, okay? Are you ready to read together? Are we ready to read this out loud together? Are we ready for the blessing that comes simply from hearing and reading his verses out loud? Y'all ready? Thumbs up, anybody? Okay, I saw that at home. Okay, good. Okay, ready? I'll start us. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Pause for a second. That's you. That's us. That's today. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Okay, let's continue. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, Grace. And from the seven spirits before his throne. Excellent. I pause so that I could hear you and enjoy the blessing of that. Keep going. And Jesus Christ, 
who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And you who are watching on live stream, I want to hear you too, okay? Ready? Let's continue. And has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look. Keep going. There's more. Look. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the people on earth will mourn because of him. And so, you know, and there's more. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You ready? Amen. Excellent. What a blessing it is to read that aloud. What a blessing it is to hear you read that aloud. Let's look at what it means. Revelation. There's a statue that was made probably in the mid-1700s, and it was done by um, a guy named Gillespie Santa. Morino. And Gillespie San Morino was an Italian. He was a stone carpenter, and he made this statue of Jesus. And this is called, this is called Veiled Christ, Pain and Hope. Veiled Christ, Pain and Hope. And, and, and you see Christ, he's laying there, and one of the commentators on the statue says, Pain. It's true. He passed from the body to the soul. The soul is sadness but not desperate or desolate. The soul has been given gall to drink, but has made a taste of consolation. The whole figure of Christ expresses the highest pain, but also the highest hope. The only thing that the faithful can do is fall to the ground weeping his death and cover his feet with tears and kisses. The word revelation means veiled. The unveiling of Christ. Imagine if you were there and you could pull back the veil. And you could see Christ in his totality. The book of Revelation does just that. It pulls back the veil and it shows us a glimpse of who Jesus is from a completely different perspective than Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Peter and some of the epistles. The Revelation from Jesus Christ. The, the New Living, the New International Version says the revelation from Jesus Christ. You might have another translation, and the other translation, whether it's a New King James or Holman Christian Standard Bible or um, English Standard Version, it could say the revelation of Jesus Christ. And one commentator even says it is about Jesus Christ, the way the prepositions in the Greek works. I think all three of them work, right? This revelation, this unveiling of Jesus is from Jesus. We know that. Read, we're going to read the text. It is from him. It is all about him. The book of Revelation is about him, and it is of Jesus. The book of Revelation is from Jesus, it is about Jesus, and it is of Jesus. Jesus is the central figure in the book of Revelation. And so we see this. We see that Jesus is the master. We start in verse 1. Jesus is the master with his servants. God, which gave him to show his servants. Jesus is the master. We are his servants. Whenever you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whenever you, you have bowed your knee and you've given your heart, you become a servant of Jesus. You become his slave. You become a slave to Christ. You can become a slave to sin or you can become a slave to Christ. And so Jesus, since he has servants, is the master. He is our master. First thing we see is that Jesus is the master with his servants. The next thing, thing we see is that he is the Lord with the angels. Jesus is not only have master of the saints, but he can tell the angels he is the Lord. He made known by he sent his angels. Jesus has power and authority over angelic beings. The angels don't have power and authority over God. God has authority over the angelic beings. And you say, that's no problem, Paul, that, that's a no-brainer, but is it really? Because so many times, if God is Lord over the angels, and God is Lord over you, but so many times, I don't know about you, but I do, I say, God, you're Lord over me, except for right now, I don't want to do your will. 
I don't, I don't want to obey you. I'm going to take the lordship over, and I'm going to be Lord, and I'm going to just push you off to the side. See, I want to have that conversation. I want to, I want to talk bad about that person. I want to live in fear. I want to live in fear because I heard this headline, and, and, and it scared me. And so, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond in fear. I'm not going to respond in faith. I'm going to respond in, in anxiety instead of peace. And so I'm going to choose, Lord, to not trust you because I think I know better than you. The revelation is from the Father. It's not just from the Son. It's from the Father. Look at the characteristic qualities. Who is and who was and who is to come. Think of it. Genesis chapter 1. Did the earth exist before or did God exist before the earth? God existed before the earth. Before eternity, um, before the earth ever came to be, God the Father Christ the Son and the Spirit all existed in, in unity. He existed. As since he existed, he created. It isn't the world created God. God created the world, so he, he was. He is. God is still in control. God is still God today. No matter what you look at, no matter how you think of the world today, God is still God. He hasn't been dethroned. And God is the one who is to come. He will come. Peace and grace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And when you digest that, when you understand that God created it, God sustains and God will always maintain, there is great peace. Because now you know, no matter what happens in Colton, in California, in America, or in the world, God is still God. He's not moved even though sometimes we are. And the revelation is from the seven spirits of the throne. The triune nature of God is there. This is a reference to an Old Testament passage found from the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah, in his chapter 11, he says this, the seven spirits of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And you're going to see this a lot. I think there are over a hundred, if not over 200, references, connections to the Old Testament found in these simple 22 chapters. 22 chapters, and, and what does John do? And he, through the wisdom of Jesus, he, he connects the old to the revelation. The Spirit of the Lord, of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge in fear of the Lord. For those of you who have been attending Wednesday night Bible study, and I want to encourage you, if you're not part of a community group, come. Come to Wednesday night, 6.30, we meet here. Come on Sunday mornings, we meet over there in the fellowship hall, back there in the boardroom. Come. For, for us who've been studying the Spirit living in us, look at what lives in us. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord dwells within you. The revelation is from the Father, from the Son, and from the Spirit. And verse 5, it goes back to who he is, the Son, who is the faithful witness. The Son, he is the faithful witness. In other words, in other words if you've got a trial, you got a trial, you, there's somebody trial, and you want to bring in your best witness. You want to bring in, who are you going to bring in? You're going to bring in the person who lies and cheats all the time and, and can't tell the honest word, it, it, it couldn't tell you a book was in his hand, if a book was in his hand because he's a liar, he's a cheater? Or do you want to bring in the faithful witness, the one that what he says is always true and always right? I don't know about you, but I want the faithful witness. The faithful witness is there. The firstborn, that's his, that's his place. He, he, he has authority because he is a firstborn. Firstborn in a culture would, would have preeminence over everyone else, and Jesus has, he is the truth speaking from his lips. Jesus has the authority because of his position, and Jesus is ruler of the kings of the earth. Church, who are we placing our faith in? Which ruler, which ruler are we listening to today? The one who is the king over the earth? Or the one who is king over his territory. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the king of kings, the lord of lords. Church, our peace comes 
from knowing that Jesus is true. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is, his word is true. His, our, our, our peace comes from the fact that he has all authority, all rights, all privileges. Our peace comes from knowing that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He rules, church. And we get the challenge of submitting to him. Listen to this. He rules. This revelation is to him who loves us. I don't know if you've figured this out, but God loves you. The king, the ruler, the one in authority, he suffered and he died for you. And for you, and for you, and for you, he suffered and he died. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Look at the quality, characteristics of the son he gave. That who should ever believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might believe in him and have life. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ, don't leave here today just kind of thinking that, yeah, I heard it, but maybe you can digest God's word as well. The revelation is to him who loves us. But not only does he love us, he loved us enough to free us. Free us from what? The Apostle Paul cleans us and tells us that he frees us from our slavery to sin before we were a christian we were we were bound we were held hostage we were slaves to our own will and our own way and and we were slaves to sin we were slaves to our selfishness and our self-centeredness and everything that we wanted to do we went ahead and did because that was who was our master and jesus christ came and he broke the shackles and he freed us we are no longer under slaves of sin we are free to serve jesus christ amen to that church for our sins by his blood ah this revelation is to him who made us you're not an accident you're not you're not just one molecule saying hi to another molecule and and creating who you are him who made us to do what to be priests. We looked at this in 1 Peter. Priests to serve God our Father, to be a kingdom. For you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own choosing. God chose you. He called you. He set you forth. He's given you the privilege to be a priest. And what is the job of a priest? The job of a priest is two things. One, to take the requests of the people to God. That's what you get to do. Church, who are you praying for? Who are you? Who 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 are you praying for? Not just the people that you know that are hurting, the people that you know are sad, but what non-Christian, what unbeliever are you coming to and say, God, bring them to faith. God, bring them to you. Who are you representing to God? And then the priest does the first thing he he takes and he and comes up and he says, God, here are the requests. The other thing a priest is is a representative of God to the people. How you live matters. How you walk, how you talk. It is important because you represent God to the people. And so when the people want to know, is Christianity true? Is it relevant? Does it make a difference? You know who they're going to turn to? You. And they're going to say, is there a changed life? Is there a changed heart? Has there, uh, oh, do they have the compassion that I think the Bible has? Absolutely. That's what you look for, church. And that's what you are. You are a priest who get to serve God the Father. And John says in his gospel, he says, as he quotes Jesus, a new command I give you, that you have love for one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We just finished three weeks in this, right? You will know, you will be his disciples if you what? Love one another. You are his disciples if you obey one in, um, his words. And you are his disciples if you bear much fruit. Three things, church. That'll be repeated throughout because it's important. Do other people know you're a disciple of Jesus? And you know how they know? Are you obeying his word? You know how they know? You're loving one another. You know how you know? You're producing fruit. Love. God loves us so much that he shed his blood for us. Are we willing to love our brothers and sisters? So this revelation is about Jesus. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That's what we're going to do, church. And and we're going to conclude it on a powerful moment. but, But he says to him, 
to Jesus be the glory. The glory of God to him be the power, the power of God forever and ever eternally. And then, then he quotes, he quotes a passage found in um, Daniel. And basically it's saying this, look, pay attention. He's coming in the clouds. Every eye will see him. It will not be a secret. I am convinced. And you would have a very difficult time convincing me differently that God operates in secret. God doesn't need to hide in the shadows. In fact, years ago, we just did a Bible study, and, and one of the things that says, oh, look, if you, someone says, oh, look, God's over here, he's over here in the desert, don't go running out to the desert to go find him because he's not there. God doesn't need to hide. He, in fact, he's given us his word so that it could reveal him, the unveiling of who he is. And that's what we're going to do for the next couple of months. We are going to unveil Jesus. You don't need to hide from him, and he is not hiding from you. Amen. You cannot hide from him, right? Look, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him, and all the people on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. He doesn't need to hide. He's not operating in secret. He's made it a mystery. And can we study it and learn and see how he operates? Absolutely. We know how he operates. And we need to do this with great humility. And we will walk through this book with humility. Why humility? Because I have learned from the Pharisees and the religious leaders in the, Old, in the New Testament. They studied the law. They, they had it memorized. And yet Jesus walked among them and they missed him. He walked among them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Go back 2,000 years and, and you're in the market. And, and you're in the market and there, there's a teacher over there. But yet you're you got something to do. You've got meat to buy. You've got things to buy. And so, so the Son of God is right over there, and you don't pay any attention to him. Oh, oh you, well, you, you're a cobbler, and, you, and you're, you're making some shoes, and, and you're too busy at work. You're too busy at work to pay attention to, to the Son of God as he walks right in front of your building. Because, well, you're, you're too distracted. You're, you're a mom and you've got, a, you've got 15 kids to raise and, and you're trying to keep the house organized and the Son of God walks in front of your place and you miss him because your leaders miss him. And so, church, I don't want to miss him. And so we will attack this chapter, this text, humbly because if other people can miss him because they're too proud, too arrogant, and they thought they knew, maybe we can learn and be humble and attack it with great humility and say, God, speak to us. Reveal yourself to us. I am the Alpha and the Omega who is and who was and who is to come, says the Lord, God Almighty. One of the books on Revelation theology I am reading talks about how he, John uses these words, and notice none of them are anthropomorphic. None of them, none of them, none of them make it hands and feet and whatever else. All they have is, is John is, is struggling to describe him. He, and so he goes from the beginning to the end. And, and how do you describe God? He doesn't know. And he was, and he is, and he is to come. He's using words that transcend human analogy. And that's how big our God needs to be. He needs to be a God that's bigger than our understanding. The moment we understand God, we're in trouble. Amen to that? Amen. And once you think, I've got God figured out, you put him in this little box, and then you can place him on the mantle, and you can forget about him because you've got God figured out. Well, you don't. I don't. He is the Alpha and the Omega, meaning he is too big for us to understand. He was, uh, he is, and he is to come. He transcends all of our humanity. And so what is our response to this? We worship. And worship tends to be an abstract word for us. We worship. What is it? Is worship the songs we sang just a second ago that, that our good brother Trevon led us in? Is that worship? Or is worship more? Well, in the ancient times, in the ancient times in Asia where this book was written, they would, they would communicate work. They would communicate in a, a way. That, I'm going to give you a word picture for the idea of worship. So when two people came together and they were of equal rank and they wanted to greet one another, the two people would come and, and if they were of both superiors and they would come, they would kiss each other on the lips. And that would be acknowledging that you and I are on the same level. And so we think of that today. We think of husbands and wives. What do they do? They kiss each other on the lips saying that they are equal to one another. 
And that's in a marriage. What do you say? Husband's wife, you may now kiss your bride. You're now equal. You're paired with one another. And then if somebody was a superior and someone was a little inferior, when they would greet one another, they would kiss each other on the cheek, symbolizing the greetings, but it would be a, a, a kiss on the greeting because the word worship has to do with the idea of a kiss. But if you've got the word worship and, and you come into somebody who is vastly superior, you instead you blow kisses at them. But you do it like this. You get down on your knees and you blow and you put your head on the ground because you're not even worthy to look at them. You're not even worthy to, to pay attention to them. And meanwhile, you keep blowing kisses at them because you are truly worshiping them. How did you worship this morning? How is your worship? Is your worship, is your worship where, where you're kissing Jesus on the lips because, well, you're good friends, you're good buds? Maybe you kiss him on the cheek. How often this week have you looked at Jesus and you just fell on your face, prostrate, worshiping Jesus, kissing him, blowing kisses to him because you're so unworthy of who he is? See, when our response to the one who is and was and is to come, our response to the Alpha and Omega, our response to the Lamb that was slain, the one who loves us, who died for us, who, who gave himself up for us is to fall on our knees and worship and nothing else. We worship the one who was. You fall on your knees. We worship the one who is. And we worship the one who is yet to come because we know that to him and to him alone belongs glory and power forever and ever. Amen application for this week. Jesus needs to be the center of prophecy. Prophecy centers on Jesus, and so therefore make Jesus the center of prophecy. Don't make a news headline the center of prophecy. Make Jesus the center of prophecy. Jesus is the center of all creation. He's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all creation. Make him the center of all creation this week. And he needs to be the epicenter of our lives. He needs to be at the core, at the epicenter of our life because we want to be people who build our house not on sand. Because when the earthquake comes, we're going to stand strong and we're going to fall on our knees and we're going to be blowing kisses this week to Jesus, worshiping the one who is and who was and is to come. So we've got a great journey in front of us, church. We've got a fantastic journey finding and falling in love with Jesus. I invite you to come for the next who knows how long as we walk through this book, falling in love with Jesus, getting a completely didactic look at who he is from another perspective. And if you have never given your life to Jesus, hey, his coming is imminent. You aren't going to have time to prepare and get your life ready and say, oh, now I've got my life ready. His coming is imminent. And so don't wait. Give your heart to Jesus today. Give your life over to Jesus and then start trying to walk in a manner worthy of him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these men and these women who, who have come to worship you. They came, Lord, and they wanted to bow down on their knees figuratively and, and just blow kisses to you because you are so worth our worship. So Heavenly Father, may you accept our worship as being true and noble and right and, and, and correct. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us, dying on a cross for us. Thank you, Jesus, for the love that you express to us through friends and family. Thank you, Jesus, for this time worship. Amen. Before Trevon leads us in a song, let's not forget there's an envelope on everybody's chair, and the envelope allows you to, to give back and say, God, everything I have is yours, and so here's my tithe, here's my offering for this month. And if you're on live stream and you're watching, click the link. Be faithful in giving. There are just as many of you who are watching as there are in the church, and yet more people in the church are 
being faithful. And so, Lord, would you bless the giver and would you bless the receiver and would you use these funds to extend your kingdom even farther. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.